Um, Namaskar, Vizya. Am I visible and audible? So we'll begin with the invocation. Saraswati Namastupyam Varadhi Kamarupini Vidyaram Bhankari Shami Siddhir Bhavatume Sada. This is the invocation that we normally do when starting our studies. So since this uh, group is uh, starting the studies of uh, Indian knowledge systems, I thought that's appropriate. So I want to talk about the uh, little bit of meta uh, discussion about what this talk is for, why is it being done? Uh, so uh, if you are going to study uh, anything, as technologists, you know that uh, first you want to understand about the uh, architecture of that thing. Right? You want to understand how the whatever it is that you are studying, how is it designed, how how does it work. So, for example, uh, if you want to uh, work on a computer system, you are going to look at wh what type of architecture it is, what type of operating system it is, and then look at the application. So same way, if you want to study a uh, deep dive to the Shastras, we need to understand what is the common uh, uh, thing about the Shastras, knowing which will enable us to understand the Shastras better. So the idea of this uh, talk is to ex uh, introduce you to those key features and concepts. It's like if you are uh, going as a tourist, you are going to a, a remote island for trekking, the guide will initially maybe instead of directly pushing you out in the forest, maybe he'll take you on a helicopter ride and show you from 10,000 feet. See, this is where this is what the landscape looks like. This is where the mountains are. This is where the valleys are. This is where the deep lakes are. This is what you need to watch out for. This is what you need to focus on. These are the things that will help you to navigate the terrain better, etc. So that's the idea of this talk. Uh, this talk as you the audience is uh, people from science, technology, engineering, etc. background who are interested in the knowledge, Indian knowledge system. So I'm not going to talk about why you should uh, uh, study them. But I would like to know your idea on why you want to uh, study Indian knowledge systems. So each of you, if you are, uh, um, if you would like to do that, just uh, write in a phrase or a sentence. Uh, what is it? Why? you want to study Indian knowledge systems. Uh, just keep it to one phrase or one sentence and put it in the chat. Okay. <clears throat> so I will go through some of that and uh, um, I will take that into account in my talk as far as possible. Uh, if, as you can see, the slides are both in uh, uh, Sanskrit and uh, English. And uh, however, I know that most of the audience uh, here Though they are interested in Sanskrit, they may not actually understand it at all or well. Therefore, this talk is going to be in English essentially. But uh, wherever it is necessary, I will introduce key Sanskrit terms. So if you don't know Sanskrit, it's perfectly fine. But if you don't know, it will help because then you will be able to connect with the words better. But uh, while I'm present, you can focus only on the English part for now. and. Uh, I know that these slides are a bit dense, but uh, I deliberately did that so that you can take them back and read them later at leisure. For those who are learning Sanskrit, it might be a good exercise to see how the same thing uh, gets represented more compactly and precisely in Sanskrit. Uh, and it's nice to read that as well later. So uh, we will ask the organizers to share this. Uh, I will share it with the organization uh, organizers after the event, and they will mail it to you so we can work at leisure. Right now, you can largely focus on my uh, what I'm saying when uh, I'm talking. And when necessary, I will um, use the pointer and point to specific parts of the screen. Otherwise, you can largely easily just look at it and then ignore it uh, when I'm talking. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, how will this help, as I said, it will help you to appreciate and understand the remaining talks in this series better. And uh, uh, how does it connect? You, uh, I request you to listen carefully and then go back and think because there will be a lot of ideas which I may talk about which you may be hearing for the first time. So you will need to diligently, cogently think about it and then 
your desire to learn is already there so that will get you to the goal mm, a couple of uh, uh, administrative announcements uh, the chat uh, is basically for i will when i ask you to uh, reply something think about something or give me some inputs you can write it in the chat but if you have a question of your own which you would uh, like uh, either me or um, uh, one of um, uh, my colleagues to answer then you can put it in the q and a so the chat is for replying to whenever i ask you something the q and a is uh, if you have a question of your own at this point i also also want to introduce bharat but who is my um, who is my uh, co panelist uh, he is a fellow student at the uh, um, sps school of vedic sciences he is doing his msc in vedic sciences uh, like i am doing my ma in sanskrit he is doing uh, msc in vedic sciences he comes from a family which has uh, traditionally had sanskrit scholars um, but he himself didn't have too much of a background in sanskrit but he is very much interested in learning uh, as a profession he does uh, digital marketing and is based in bangalore uh, thank you bharat for uh, agreeing to be the co panelist so he will look at the q and a questions and he will answer whatever he can and those which uh, he wants to pass on to me we will do all the q and a Um, lastly, at the end of the talk, so I need to present for about 40, 45 minutes, and then throw it open for about 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, as a technologist, what do we expect from any system? so whether it is uh, indian knowledge systems or whether it's a new aircraft being designed or whether whether it's a computer what is it that you look for uh, first thing is it has to be applicable we are not interested in theory uh, alone we want something which can be put to practical use uh, in whatever way it can be used so that is the first fundamental thing as technology as opposed to pure science we are in technology right so we are interested in practical use second is uh, before we get into any system we want to understand what, what are the axioms the fundamental assumptions that that system would make about uh, how it is designed or how it is made and the uh, the design want to make sense to us so what are the axioms then what is based on those axioms what is the architecture or the structure of that uh, system and uh, that system will have actually some content matter so for example if the if it's a computer system then it will have a lot of applications uh, if it is indian knowledge system then there will be actually a lot of knowledge systems which will have in depth information about different domains like uh, grammar vyakaran may talk about grammar or nyaya may talk about uh, logical reasoning etc so that is the content matter but across all of these there will be a common process and methodology so we want to understand that process and methodology so that's what we expect from any system so the question i want you to ask yourself in this uh, talk is uh, do indian knowledge systems have all these if they do then it's worthy of study it can be called as a scientific system as a system um, you know which is well thought out so that's uh, would you all agree uh, that this is uh, what we expect from the system and th these things we should study so the focus of the talk is on the first uh, four parts which are in black and understanding that will put you in a good place to do for the rest of the series which is mainly about the content matter right okay so i'm going to take a, a half a minute to go and read some of what you have typed here ved purana san granthas okay important to understand the roots advanced civilization okay understand the technology in a better way 
All right. So yeah, so I think uh, uh, you are in the right place. With, if you have those kind of uh, expectations, then we hope to address that. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, my own experience uh, because this uh, series is not uh, uh, expert to uh, layman kind of a thing. I'm also a student and I've just started learning this uh, field. Therefore, I want to share my experiences as a, a, a student. Maybe you're, you're just beginning and I've done about a year of that, but still I'm, I consider myself a student. Anybody who enters uh, Sanskrit or Shastras would know that However much you study, you still consider yourself to be a student. So uh, I'm basically not uh, standing here as an expert and saying I know everything about everything. I'm here to share what I'm excited about, the few things which I have so far observed and which I think is valuable. So uh, before, so to put that in context, I want to say what is it that I thought about these uh, when I, when the word Indic knowledge systems was uh, was would have been used to me. Uh, before I uh, started learning about it, what were my thoughts? And uh, you can tell me if your thoughts were any different from this, then you can type it in the chat. So if you if you were asked what is Indic knowledge systems, uh, what does what do they mean to you? So my concept was something like this. Um, okay, Indic knowledge systems. So I think there is Vedas, Puranas, Upanishads. Beyond that, what is there? I had really no idea. That was one. Second is, uh, I thought it was mainly about, you know, philosophy, a lot of rituals. It's about spirituality. It is about mythology like Rama and Mahabharata. So that was the second conception I had. And I thought that is mainly, it is mainly about that. The third concept uh, um, perception I had was that uh, it is, it has all this aura about it is uh, magical. Uh, it has, uh, it is very advanced. It is not to be logically analyzed. It is not logical. It is more magical than logical was how I would put it. That was my perception. Second was that it is more cultural than practical. Why should I study it? Because it is our heritage and it is part of our culture. Of course, that is one answer. But then uh, question is, uh, does it have any practical use in this day and age? So that was always a question some people may have. I had this question, except I knew that there was some evidence, like I knew that the Sanskrit can be used for AI or computers. Everybody has heard that. There's a lot of talk about that. I heard about Greek maths is useful for learning maths. And I know that yoga and yoga become popular as lifestyle choices and uh, well-being choices. So I knew there was some value there. So I thought, okay, maybe these are exceptions, but the rest of it probably, you know, it's more of historical value and cultural, uh, like a sentimental thing, it is ours, so we should study. It was honest, my honest perception. And uh, the last was that whatever is there is static. It was written by some people very long ago, and it has stayed frozen there. It has not been updated. That was my perception. So uh, do any, did any of you have these kind of perceptions, or was it drastically different from any of you? Currently, what is the perception? So you can put it in the chat, a couple of you, uh, your comments. Do you agree, disagree? So anyway, that was where I was. But uh, when I started learning this about a year ago, um, it was like a revelation because I realized, hey, uh, there is much more to this than I thought. And that's what some of it I want to share with you here. So what is it then? Uh, what is, what did I learn? What I learned was that uh, IKS, I'm going to use IKS as a short form for Indic knowledge systems or Indian knowledge systems. It's a vast integrated ecosystem. It is not just one or two, uh, it's not just Vedas and Puranas and one or two Upanishads, but it's a vast, ecosystem that addresses almost every aspect of life that is relevant to us as humans. And uh, 
more importantly, it, it may be the only ecosystem that directly and centrally addresses the question, what is the purpose of life? If you think about it for a moment, uh, what is knowledge about? It is something which has to be of use to you and it has to have a purpose. So in, in turn, it asks the question, uh, what is my purpose? Or what is the purpose of life? So if it addresses those questions, then it is directly relevant, isn't it? So this, all the Indian knowledge systems directly, they always have this in mind, what is the purpose of life? And they address that question very directly and upfront. Um, so that is the first thing I learned. Second is, uh, I realized that the Indian knowledge systems are based, as like some of you have written, it's based on an advanced worldview. So it is a little bit like uh, we study uh, Newtonian mechanics and it works. But when we study quantum physics, we realize that Newtonian mechanics was an approximation. It's not that it is invalid, but that there are different levels of uh, worldviews, different levels of perception, and some can be including more elements than others, and some are applicable in variety of scenarios. So Indian knowledge systems is applicable in a wide variety of scenarios. Uh, uh, and uh, whether it is whether you are interested in very practical things like uh, you know um, creating uh, good things out of different metals. So there is a metallurgy which looked at how to create um, you know like iron pillars which don't rust. Right from there to uh, if you are deeply interested in who you are as a person and what is uh, your ultimate aim. So it addresses the whole range spectrum of uh, uh, interest. And it can do that because it is an advanced worldview. And uh, what is some of the key elements of that? First is in Indian knowledge systems, you there are two, three things you will observe in common. One is that it is inclusive. It tries to have a unified approach. Instead of having separation, it is about connectedness. It is about oneness. And therefore, it uh, it uh, always says that human is an integral part of the entire cosmos and everything is connected with each other. So, for example, uh, if everything is connected, then you're not likely to go and destroy something just because it is outside of you. You view it as part of yourself in some way. So in Arthashastra, for example, when they say about Loka, it is not just people. It includes trees, animals, plant, uh, rivers, water systems. Everything is included and they are as much entitled to being nurtured, protected, valued, etc. as you. So this is one uh, uh, part of it. Second is uh, any knowledge system, what, uh, what should it uh, should it re restrict itself to particular types of knowledge or should it be more open? What do you think? Uh, um, so the Indian knowledge systems uh, is, it allows us to deal with different types of cognition and different knowledge sources, various uh, types of knowledge. And uh, it is not, uh, people sometimes have this, uh, notion that it is uh, prescriptive it always tells us what to do it doesn't tell us how to how to, to do it or why to do it it doesn't give us the logic that's not the case at all it is very much descriptive when i talk when we talk about shastras we will see that uh, they are purely descriptive works they describe a domain and say these are the objects these are the relations between them this is how it works and it leaves you the choice whether you want to do it or not, that's your choice. But it says, if you do this, this is what will happen. If you do that, that is what will happen. It's like, for example, if you're designing a traffic system um, and you say that uh, if you want efficient running of traffic, then traffic should behave a certain way. Uh, when there's a green light, you should go. When there's a red light, you should stop. Now, you can say whether that is telling us what to do or whether it's describing. So I would say it is describing what is required to be done for traffic to go smoothly. So based on the goal, it is describing what are the conditions that will fulfill that goal. And then the choice is ours. If we violate that, then obviously there will be consequences. We will have accidents. But otherwise, it's basically describing what happens. So it's the same with all our knowledge systems. They look at various aspects of the world. They try to understand what is there. They capture it. 
and then they say this is what it is. And for doing this, it accommodates various steps. So, if, for example, some people only want to restrict themselves to what they can see with the senses. Nothing else exists for me. Whatever I touch, sense, smell, uh, see, that's my world. So fine, that is supported. If you want to extend beyond that, because we know that there are many experiences which don't fit in that framework. For example, I feel sad, happy, I love my parents, I love my children, my friends. These are also valid experiences. So how do I leave them out? They need to be included. So you can expand that scope and say, OK, these also are valid cognitions. There is valid knowledge sources for representing these and so on. Um, so there's multiple layers and it allows all that. The other major difference is uh, you will always find that um, in, in Indian knowledge systems, the one fundamental assumption is time is cyclic. It is not linear. Right. So very often, people ask, uh, very often this question comes to us when you see a particular work, uh, who wrote it, when was it written? When, when did this event actually occur exactly? So very often we don't find precise answers to that in our uh, system. And the reason is, if you think about it, if time according to you is linear, then it makes sense to order between events. You can say this event happened before this event, and you can meaningfully talk about when something happened. But if time for you is a circle and it goes cyclic, then after a certain time, what was before will become after, isn't it? When so it doesn't, it is not of much interest or relevance to say what came before, what came after, where exactly, some, when exactly something happened. What is, what happened is of interest, but when exactly it happened, it is somewhere in that circle, you know, so that's how it is. So that's important to understand why uh, that is the case. Similarly, you might find that uh, most of the Indian works, they don't have a concept of copyright or patent. They are, uh, so that comes out of this idea that everything is connected. So if there is no separation of me and the rest of the world, whatever is created is common property and shareable. But they do, it's not that the author is completely ignored. You will always find that every grantha has uh, the uh, name of who authored it and it is acknowledged and then there are commentaries written on it and we know who the commentators are. It's just that they don't go too much into biographical details that he was born in this country and he was uh, he was born in this year. Those details are left off because they are not central to the subject matter. So that's another thing to remember. Okay, and uh, what does the Indian knowledge systems do? It I, it unifies both tangible and intangible knowledge. So we spoke about this. So whatever I can touch, smell with my senses, and I can, uh, you know, think of with my mind is tangible. And there are a lot of things intangible also beyond that. So should we leave them out or should we include them? So Indian knowledge system chooses to include them in, the com in a common framework. Okay. And uh, another thing is, we will see this later, but just uh, I want to mention it here itself, that it as assumes that the observer is as important as what is being observed. And uh, for the long time, we have been taught that objective science, science should be objective. That means it should not be dependent on the observer and whatever is observed should be the same irrespective of observer. That is true of many phenomena, but not of all phenomena. For example, when quantum physics was discovered, the first thing they found that light can be either a particle or a wave, depending on what is being observed. So whether light is a particle or a wave depends on the intent of the observer, right? So from that moment onwards, the idea that science can be only objective is not true. To a large extent, it is true. It is like Newtonian um, mechanics is true for a certain within a framework. Beyond that, if you want to go deeper, then it becomes quantum physics. So same way here, certain phenomena seem to be objective, but if you go deeper, you find that there is a subjective element. So Indian knowledge systems acknowledges, recognizes, and includes. Them. So in summary, it's basically a rigorous, very vibrant, and, and the inclusive tradition that supports divergent viewpoints. It's not, doesn't say, there is only this way to look at it. 
it says okay you feel this way fine we will include that in this framework and we'll find that all the time and then it has a framework for practicing whatever you have uh, learned and then preserving it and evolving it it is by no means frozen in time if we look at later on in the series we will look at all the shastras have evolved from something was original written and then somebody went and analyzed it thought about it and wrote a commentary then there were discussions and then it got evolved some shastras have got merged saying that there are common elements why do we need both then they have merged it and all that has happened so until almost even now there is um, in some branches of shastras there are still people coming out with uh, you know new um, uh, treatises and uh, theses and so on so it's a vibrant inclusive and live tradition these are this is what i learned i want to uh, check at this point whether my speed is okay do i need to go faster or slower are you guys able to understand what i'm saying is it making sense if not then please uh, you know um, point out in the chat otherwise i'll assume that uh, this kind of pace and style is okay with everybody right so uh, so let's let's uh, ask the ask ourselves the question so since we are saying indian knowledge systems and we have got some background of what uh, what is there and how it is different and all that so let's go to the meat of the thing what is knowledge can one or two of you uh, answer in the chat or all of you as many of you as want you can write in the chat according to you what is knowledge some of these things are easy to understand but difficult to explain but if we want to do things scientifically we should be able to say what it is or at least give a working definition of it which makes sense so what is knowledge Anyone want to try? Have you has anybody written a piece of information that is the tool that drives our belief, pure understanding about any subject, piece of information that is able to describe a phenomenon in a precise way, observations, internalized fact of nature, experience. Okay. Yeah. so uh, all these are definitely part of what knowledge is but let's look at how indian knowledge systems views it and what it talk what it says about so what it says is that there are three states of knowledge so first of all there are there is one point here that if something is true it should be true for everybody right meaning there should be only one uh, knowledge knowledge should be one for example if this is a poem then this is a poem there can't be two ways about it if it's opinion then there can be n opinions but if it's a reality it fits a fact and there can be only one poem right so in that sense one can say there is only one knowledge and what is that it is something which sets you free saha vidya ya vimuktaye is how it is said in sanskrit so if you think about it this very uh, elegant definition because what ultimately what is the role of knowledge is to liberate you from some uh, issue you are having or some problem you are trying to solve and when you uh, get the solution for that uh whether it is something as simple as i want to get from point a to point b what transport do i take or what do i do for the next 10 years with my life either case once you know what is the answer it you, you feel free right you feel uh, out of that constraint so any knowledge which sets you free is anything that sets you free is called knowledge so that is one uh, definition given in our uh, knowledge 
and this holds uh, for various, uh, anything, any phenomenon you take, uh, you can say this applies. Um, second is, this knowledge now can take different states, right? So when, for example, um, some, when, when uh, you're thinking about something, you get an insight, you suddenly, there's a flash of inspiration, we call it intuition or uh, uh, insight, whatever it is. We don't have a logic for it at that, that point, but we just know that this must be the case. So at that, it is pure knowledge. So it's in, in this pyramid, you can see at the top, there's knowledge. And that immediately uh, gives you a spark. But now you take that and then you apply your logical mind to it and you reason about it, saying, does it make sense? I apply it in the light of my practical experiences in life. Does it gel in with the rest of my experiences? Is it making sense? So it's a combination of intuition and experience and along with a worldview. How do I view uh, the world in general? Do I class, for example, do I try to classify everything in terms of uh, objects and relations? Or do I look at it as actions? Or do I look at it as uh, descriptions? So there could be different way of uh, describing and looking at the world. So, and you would try to take that insight or intuition and express it logically. So if the first topmost level is about intuition or insight, the second one is about combining that with experience and logic, and then worldview. So that is called darshana. The first is called vidya, second is called darshana. Now, with this, you are able to, so the vidya was only with you. You had that insight and it was you were not able to express it in words. You just knew something, that was it. At that point, it is vidya. When you logically think about it, you put your worldview and express it, then it can be shared with other people and other people can get included in that. And then they can have a similar sight and then maybe it can be practice also. For example, yoga is called a darshan because it talks about how to uh, purify your uh, mind and uh, how to make yourself into a healthy person, etc. So then there is an element of uh, insight and there's an element of experience. It has to be practice. You can't just, for example, swimming, you can do all the books that you want, but it's only when you actually swim with a coach that you don't know how to swim. So some of this knowledge is like that. It is experiential knowledge. So there's a insight part and there's a practice part, which normally has to be done under guidance of a guru. Okay. Now, with that, you get some more maturity about that subject. Now we want to make it available to mass people for some practical use. So that's when you have to put it in the form of a Shastra. So shastra is nothing but uh, methodically encoded knowledge about a particular domain. So for example, initially, maybe humans didn't have a concept of counting. So somebody suddenly realized, oh, there is something common when I say uh, there is a clock here, there is a book here. What is common between these is that there is something called one. Now this one doesn't exist in nature. In nature, what you have is clock, book, etc. But somebody suddenly had this insight that there's some concept called number. And for this case, it is one. And if there are, you know, there's, if I bring another clock and put it there, then it is not one anymore, it is two. So this whole concept of number was initially a you know, insight. Then somebody reflected in it and said, this is applicable in wide variety of cases. And there can be some, um, you know, more enhancement of it. But if you want to then um, teach it to others and make it practically useful in other areas, then you have to actually make it into a science. You can you have to say these are the hypotheses. This is how these are the objects. I have uh, you know integers, whole numbers, and this is how I will use them. These are what uh, this is what is applicable for them, etc. So that whole uh, methodical encoding is nothing but what we call shaft. So these are the three levels. If you go from top to bottom, so there are, so again, like everything in Indian knowledge systems, nature is cyclic, right? It, nothing stays the same. It goes through a cycle and it goes back to the original. So just like a man is born uh, as a child, then he becomes, uh, grows up, becomes father, he has a child, and that guy dies, and then the child becomes. So it's like that. So same way here, we see that first you have an insight, then it becomes darshana, then it becomes shah. 
and shastra is applicable for many people people as they use it they get new insights into it so that again goes back up the chain so this part going from top to bottom is exposition where you are trying to, to reach out to many people and the other part is realization so when you are practicing you get some more insights that becomes an addition to your darshan either it becomes a validation of darshan or the darshan gets modified saying okay it's not including all the phenomenon we need to change this so then you have a modified version of that and once you that is distilled enough that becomes new knowledge so then it goes back to the top and then you start all over again you take that so this is a continuous cycle and this is how knowledge keeps getting updated and evolved so this is the basically basically this is the architecture of indian knowledge systems for knowledge okay so with this backdrop uh, what are these knowledge systems that we keep talking about so there are many of them and i'm not going to go into the details of this slide because uh, we are going to have see we can't do justice to this topic in only one session we need at least two to three sessions so the way we have structured this is today i will just talk about the key points which are of interest and some of these things i will show just for completeness and making connections later so later on when uh, we go into it in more detail you will have the background so indian knowledge systems are classified into various categories so there is vedas then there is vedangas there are upangas and there are sub upvedas depending on what is the nature so like in the previous diagram you saw that the same knowledge can take different states so this is something like that so vedas might be thought of as vidya what is in between the vedangas and the upangas can be thought of as darshanas and the upvedas can be thought of as shastras but it's not that uh, hard and fast there are you know uh, flexible boundaries some of these uh, even in the middle can be um, validly called as shastras and so on so all those details we will go into subsequently right now just think of this as a big picture this is how it connects there are these three types of states of knowledge and each of these are expressible as one of one or the more of those states and each of these uh, vidya sthanas have a definite purpose they are all interlinked none of nothing is um, hanging um, in loose air um, so um whether whether so for example uh, to take to study any shastra like ayurveda you, you need to know uh, vyakarana and you need to know nyaya it is assumed that you know those and it will have direct application of those so every shastra every knowledge system in this uh, diagram has a definite connection with every other because they are all uh, ultimately they are all uh, believed to come from the same knowledge okay because knowledge is one so that's the assumption but it takes different forms based on purpose based on its uh, application so it takes different states therefore there is no uh, watertight separation like uh, this is the art this is the science you will notice that whether it is uh, the art of doing makeup or the art of uh, writing poetry or the art of um, uh, having dramas you know writing plays and so on that is also called shastra there is a natya shastra there is a kavya shastra or whether it is uh, something like what we call the hard sciences like physics uh, chemistry maths those are also shastras because any systematic examination and encoding of knowledge is called shastra for us so this we have largely talked about uh, this slide it is just repeating whatever i already said one point to note is the veda it focuses on sound so in veda what is important is the frequency more than the meaning and therefore it has been preserved by an oral tradition and uh, irrespective of which our system we are talking about are all related to one or more purusharthas which are called so that is the purpose element of it why would you study something is because it is you remember i said everything relates to the purpose of life so purpose of life is divided into four parts so it is related to that so uh, veda basically means knowledge and it is treated as the 
considered as the primary source of all knowledge. Everything else is supposed to be directly or indirectly derived from that. And in Veda itself, the focus is more on the sound. So when you hear that frequency, then something happens. And this makes sense because we know from uh, physics that uh, sound is the only energy that can, um, only form of wave that can carry energy. So it can directly impact matter. That's why in Indian knowledge systems, more importance is on sound rather than uh, visual medium. Uh, therefore, they believe more in whatever is precious should be preserved uh, by consciously by putting it in your head so that if moment you externalize it, we don't know whether it is still pure or somebody has changed it, there is errors introduced. We can see a direct example of that. The Vedas, because they were uh, maintained by an oral tradition, they were they had come up with precise mechanisms to make sure that not a single uh, varna or swara in that was changed. For more than uh, many thousand years, uh, the way it was chanted 3,000 years ago is the way it is chanted now. It has been preserved impeccably. But Mahabharat, for example, was written down. And there are umpteen versions and revisions, and nobody knows what is the authentic version. So maybe our ancestors knew this thing that sound is the right way to preserve knowledge and transmit it from generation to generation because it doesn't need to be externalized it can remain with you um, darshana as we said it means that which shows the way to true knowledge that's how the world derives and it defines a worldview and has both theory and practice components and shastra literally means that which governs what does it govern a specific domain and therefore, it's a methodical definition and description of a domain. Domain means objects and relations in that domain. Okay, so now across all Indian knowledge systems, um, whether it is Shastras or Darshanas, there are certain core concepts and elements you'll see again and again. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, as I said, uh, the question of purpose is central to all Indian knowledge systems. These purposes are um, of four types, four purusharthas. Purushartha means, push here doesn't mean um, male or man. It means human being. So objectives worthy of a human. Okay, they are kama, artha, dharma and moksha. Now, there are, uh, there are uh, very popular definitions or translations of these words. But one of the advantages of uh, learning Sanskrit uh, is that you are able to go to the root of a word and see what is it, uh, how that word originated. So I'll just give you one example of an insight which I had. So dharma, for instance, is used in various different contexts and it means different things to different people and so on. But if you look at the origin of the term dharma, then it comes from the root dhatu, dhru, which is related to hold the action of holding so basically dharma is something which either holds or is held so if you think about it as an engineer or technologist how would i define it i would say that which holds or is held is basically the design of something so if you say what is the dharma of a car it is to take excellent fuel and provide transport that is its dharma now as long as the car is running by that design, we can say it is following its dharma. When it's not, then we can say it is not following its dharma. That means there is a breakdown. So this is as simple a technical definition of dharma we can give. It is basically integrity to the design. So we can talk about dharma of a thing. We can talk about dharma of a person. We can talk about dharma of a group. Like what is our dharma as citizens or as Indians, as humans? Or we can talk about dharma of the whole universe, uh, which means the design of the whole universe. So that is really what is meant when we say dharma with a capital D. If you just say dharma, that means what is it's the design of everything. So if everything is working according to that design, then things work well and they work well with each other. If you violate that, then there will be eventually a breakdown. It basically means it's an unsustainable condition. That's for, therefore, for example, when they said you should not cut trees indiscriminately, you should not damage the environment, uh, they say it is a violation of dharma. What does it mean? It violates the design. 
you are supposed to nurture these things and coexist with them. And if you violate that, sooner or later you're going to pay the price. So it is nothing to do with morality or religion or uh, you know a belief system. It's as simple as understanding deep down what is the design of something. And it is common sense that if you understand the design, you should follow it. If you violate it, it's going to break down. So if you think back and it applies to everything. So same way we can say karma is not. It's not about sensuality or sex alone. It is any wholesome desire which is consistent with dharma. Similarly, artha is not just about money. It is management in general of wealth and any resources. So without karma, life cannot exist. If I'm born, if I just sit and say I don't want to do anything, uh, I cannot, you know. So need to have wholesome desires in order to meet those desires we need to have resources and manage them but the use and um, acquisition and use of those resources has to be consistent with dharma that means we cannot violate uh, any design of how we are meant to work with each other and with the environment or the universe and uh, finally by doing all this we are supposed to transcend Continuously transcend limitation. So moksha is not just a one-time dream goal to be attained or not attained at some point. At every moment, if we are transcending whichever limitation we are currently experiencing, that is a small moksha happening. Right? For example, if you have a fear of heights, if we conquer that and go into bungee jumping or para flying, then at that moment we experience moksha. Because we have transcended the limited our perceived limitation that we can't do. So uh, that's that's the four Purushatvas. Now uh, you'll find that any Indian knowledge system will not be designed just for the heck of it. Just because I know I do something and it will not be done. It has to fit one or more of these Purushatvas. Only then it will be considered worthy of being pursued. By that mechanism, it automatically brings in a kind of accountability. You will not create technology that is eventually harmful to our sense or the environment, etc. That is one thing. Um, second is, uh, you'll always talk about, you'll hear this word pramana very often. So um, there needs to be a whole different uh, session on um, knowledge and uh, how it is um, classified, how it is uh, gathered how, and so on. But very briefly, uh, there are, you know, four parts to uh, knowledge. So there is prameya, which is what is to be known. For example, when I say I know um, history, then history is the prameya. It is what is known. It's the subject. And who is knowing it is the pramata. That is me, knower. Then uh, how do I know it is the source? So for example, I read from a book. Um, so that is the source. And once I say I know history, that means I have some altered state in me. So that that part is called that knowledge that the part which is inside me is called knowledge uh, is called prama. So these are the four elements. So the focus is on this source uh, because the rest of it is clear. But the source can be of different types, right? For example. Uh, I may directly perceive something through the senses. So that is called Pratyaksha Prama. So I touch a book uh, and I know that it's a book. I touch something um, and it's hot, so I say it is hot. Or I uh, see something and I know that this is a clock, this is a mobile, this is my laptop, this is a keyboard. How do I know it? Because my eyes are directly in contact with that uh, input and uh, my brain does some processing and that tells me. So this is called uh, Pratyaksha Pramana, direct perception through senses. It's the most basic form of um, Pramana. Now, there are a lot of things which don't uh, fit only in that. For example, um, the most way it is given, explained in our Shastras is, you see far off there is a mountain and you see smoke coming out of that. Now, what can you infer? You can infer that there must be fire on the mountain. Why? Because wherever there is smoke, there must be fire. So though you are not directly seeing the fire with your eyes, you are, there is no Pratyaksha Pramana, but there is Anumana. You are able to logically infer the unknown from the known. 
what is known as smoke. That is through direct perception, pratyaksha praman. What is not known as fire, but it can be logically inferred. You can show a chain of reasoning saying this, therefore this, therefore this. And we'll see that in the uh, subsequent slides. So this is Anumana. Then third and most interesting, uh, which may be different for you is, first two is obvious. Shabda, which is word of an accepted authority. If you think about it, this is we do this all the time. Uh, not everything we know can be accounted for by just uh, Pratyaksha prama, Pratyaksha or Anumana. There are many things which we accept because they come from some source that we believe to be authentic and authoritative. This is called Shabda Pramana. Okay. So these three minimally will be supported by almost all the schools of thought. There are some differences. Some people don't consider Shabda as a Pramana. Some people uh, have many other types of Pramana which they consider necessary. But others say, no, no, these are all special cases of only these. But by and large, these three are uh, across most of the schools of thought. These are accepted. That's why I put those. Then another common thing you'll come across in all Shastras is concept of Lakshana. So what is Lakshana is uh, it's a definition. So a definition needs to be precise. So that's the whole job of a Shastra. It is to create Lakshana of the, it's to create definitions of the objects and the relations between them. So this definition has to be free from uh, all uh, possible errors. So there are three types of errors defined. Over pervasion, under pervasion, and inapplicability. They are called Ativyapti, Avyapti, and uh, Asambhava. We will uh, have a separate session uh, for Nyaya where we will look into this in more detail. <laughs> but uh, this give, to give you an idea that uh, this terminology exists and uh, you will come across this very often. And what is the definition? It's basically a unique property. So now this word dharma again comes up here. In this context, it means property. It doesn't mean the design of something, but it just means something has something. So for example, um, I have a mobile. So now the mobile becomes a dharma because it is held and I'm holding it. So I became I'm called a dharmi and this is called a dharma. So this, uh, this is a, this dharmi, dharma dharmi bhava is uh, universally used in all our knowledge systems. And it is the key to understanding almost everything else because everything is expressed as a dharma. So I am so any kind of relation or property can be thought of as a dharma because I am currently holding this. Therefore, there is some relation between this mobile and me. But this is a temporary relationship. Right now it is there. If I keep it down, it is not connected. To me. So it's a temporary relation. But something like, uh, you know, uh, my skin is a part of me. So therefore, it is not going to uh, uh, disappear unless I uh, go with, with it. So it will exist as long as I exist. That kind of thing is a more permanent relation. There are different types of relation. And, uh, uh, you know, um, a definition should take into account what is the precise thing uh, and give a definition which is uh, not over pervasive, under pervasive or inapplicable. Um, then uh, there is there is uh, needs to be three for clarity before we begin any work in in the analysis. We have to ask what is to be accomplished, by what means it is to be accomplished, and what process. So this is called kim uh, bhavayet, kena bhavayet, and katham bhavayet. So there is equal importance to all these. We don't just say what is to be done and leave it. There is process. For example. In the Vedas, they define yajnas. So for each of for the yajnas, there are elaborate uh, uh, dis descriptions. There is the entire Shastra called Mimamsa, which deals with how the Vedas, Vedavakyas, to get a precise sequence of operations for performing yagas correctly so that the desired result can be obtained. So this, there are a lot of ideas about discourse analysis and uh, project, uh, etc., which can be uh, derived from that and uh, 
So there is this type of clarity for all the shards. So I have uh, this uh, slide, but I'm not going to go into it because it's kind of we are running short of time. And anyway, I was not planning to cover this in detail. You will need a separate lecture on just on what is the definition or overview of Shastra. So I will talk about it. I'm showing this slide just to say that there is a lot of thought that has gone into how a Shastra should be defined, what are the steps in creating Shastra, what is the process involved, what are the principles involved. And it is very, very uh, well thought out, very mature, and a lot of scientific. Uh, um, concepts that are in there. Um, examples of Shastras, uh, almost anything in that uh, diagram which I show, uh, can be called Shastra. Um, Vyakrana, Nyaya, Ganita, Jyotisha, Mimamsa, Dharma Shastra, Arta Shastra. You must be familiar with all these terms. Mm, okay, so this is the core part of what I want to talk about. What are the aspects? So what we have seen so far is there in um, you know, any science, whether it is Indian science or Western science, a lot of this will have to be done in definitions, making precise definitions, having the processes. So we also have that. But this is what I want to talk about uh, and call out. That you gives you orientation when you do the rest of the so first is primacy of uh, RN. I have deliberately used AURN because that means uh, hearing. Oral means mouth, speaking. So this is more about hearing. It is a Shruti Parampara. So oral or spoken rather than visual or written. And we have talked about why this is the case, right? Because we believe that the language, word and meaning are inseparable. There is a shloka from Raghavansha which says, uh, uh, so it means uh, these word and the meaning are inseparable. They are connected always like Shiva and Parvati. That's what that shloka says. So therefore, we believe that uh, you cannot separate the two. We cannot have a meaning without a word. And since all knowledge is about meaning, uh, we have to include. Therefore, language, culture, and uh, knowledge, they go hand in hand. You can't understand one without understanding all three. Second, as I've said, central role of observer in knowledge cycle, uh, closely connected with the fact that uh, the world uh, at some level is subjective, it is not just objective. Third is inclusion of Shabda as a Pramana. Again, we don't want to restrict ourselves only to a phenomenon which we can see or we can logically infer, because there are more. there's more experiences in life than can be just explained by these two. Therefore, we include Shabda and very practical also because even, for example, in uh, uh, when you write thesis, very often when you write, you say so and so expert expert has opinion, given this opinion, and therefore it gets more weighted. So we just justify our uh, thesis, uh, some of the points by saying that this expert has also said. So this is not a new idea. It has been there and it's still there. Then, um, Purpose is given based on four Purushathas. The next um, concept which may be new to you is called Anubandha Chatushnaya, four element constitution of every Shastra. So whenever we define a Shastra, initially we have to answer this question. Who is the Adhikari? Means what is, who is the eligible person? What is the definition of Adhikari? What criteria should a person meet in order to study this Shastra? Second is, what is the subject matter? Third is, what is the priyojanam? What is the purpose? Why should I study this? What will be the benefit or the goal? And fourth is, what is the connection between all these and how do I actually go? So if you see um, my first talk, uh, first slide had all these four components. What, who, what is it about? Who is it for? How will it help? How does it connect? So we can call this as the Anubandha Chatush time of this talk. And you will find this uh, without fail in every Shastra, though sometimes some element may be more emphasized than the others, may be uh, implicit, so it is not called out explicitly, etc. But this notion exists. Another important and interesting thing, which is unique about Indian knowledge systems, is they 
prefer to use natural language, which is Sanskrit, rather than introduce an artificial notation. As far as possible, they write the Shastra using Sanskrit in natural language. Uh, for example, one of the common complaints uh, is that maths is very difficult, is abstract. Why has it become abstract is because we have introduced artificial notation, which we don't use in everyday. Right? Moment you say, uh, talk, want to talk about something, we'll say let x equal to something, and there, let there be a set with element. So if you're comfortable with that, it's great. But for most people, that moment they see those abstract symbols, they switch off and they say this is complicated. Therefore, instead of creating artificial notation, Indian Shastras, as far as possible, use natural language. Now, what could be a concern there is natural language by its nature is ambiguous. There are always going to be multiple, um, you know, um, meanings or senses of a word based on the context. Therefore, what they do is, wherever required, they use a domain-specific meta definition, which is called paribhasha, for those particular words which have a special meaning in that shastra to avoid ambiguity. For example, the word prakruti has different meanings in different shastras. In Ayurveda, it means the constitution of a person, whether he is uh, more inclined for vata, or kapha. As in grammar, it means the basic uh, root of a word, whether it is dhatu or pratipadikam, on which pratyas are added. That is called prakruti. Uh, if you go to Sankhya, then it might, it is called the basic element out of which everything, the whole creation gets uh, created. So there are different, so each uh, Shastra defines its own Paribhasha, which is the uh, special terminology of that Shastra. Uh, the next thing is that every Shastra has a seamless Shastra Parampara. This is also another unique thing. In uh, Western science, what happens is that uh, people write thesis and uh, they refer to, but nowhere do we have a continuous uh, flow. Like in Shastra, what happens is somebody who originally uh, writes, he, he conceptualizes the domain, he writes very compact sutras, which represent the core elements of that Shastra. Then somebody does further analysis and they find that there are some gaps, something was missed out, something needs to be clarified. They write what is known as Vartika. When they write that, they have the reference of the original sutras there. So it is not a separate uh, book which is only having references. That whole actual sutra will get quoted and then it will be analyzed or it will be modified. Similarly, some people can write Prakriya Granthas. Sutra by themselves are very crisp and very compact. But if you want to do a whole process and see how it is actually applied, then people can write saying that, you know, for solving this particular problem, you take this sutra and this sutra and that sutra and apply it in this sequence, and then you get the desired result. That kind of a thing is called Prakriya Granta. Then there are Bhashyas, which are detailed commentaries, because the sutras may be very cryptic, because they're all these, if you remember, there's a oral traditions. Most of these things were handed down by Guru Shishya Parampara through memorizing. So the sutras needed to be very compact, so that they could be memorized, and at any point, you have the whole science in your head. You don't need to refer anything. You can go walk in and apply that thing wherever you are. So that was the idea. Therefore, all you need to do, so it, all this body of knowledge actually adds to that domain and it creates more clarity. But ultimately, even if it's a thousand page bhasha, it all connects back to the original sutras. So you can always say, if you just remember the sutra, then the whole thing can expand like an audience or it can compress back based on what you want to do. So this kind of a seamless um, transition can happen. And the last point is that there is a very um, live, lively tradition of debate for establishing the truth. So whenever there is a doubt about something, there can be difference of opinion, there can be unclarity. The experts uh, have a tradition of engaging in a debate. So they have classified different forms of debate. You know, so like different forms of conversation. So if it is for, if all the parties are clear that their aim is to um, arrive at the truth, then it's called vada. If the aim becomes distorted and if it is, if you are talking only to prove that you are victorious by any means, then it is called chalpa. And if you are only engaging in conversation to 
pull down the opponent. You don't have a strong viewpoint of your own, but whatever the opponent is saying, you're going to smash it down by some means. That is called Vithanda. So Jalpa and Vithanda are discouraged. Vada is encouraged, saying that, guys, if you want to establish the truth, engage in Vada. There are whole, there's a whole literature about what is Vada, how to engage in it, what are the rules? How can you logically establish your uh, point and, uh, you know, uh, Keep the opponent and establish this whole thing is how all these have evolved from the original. So it is not that they are frozen in time. They have been constantly evolving. Certain cases, the disciple has proved something which the guru has acknowledged that this is superior. So you you know call the guru, and uh, both matas coexist and they actively debate, and all these things have happened. Sometimes shastras have got merged. For example. Uh, there was something called old nyaya which was about how to classify the world into relations and objects they had originally 16 different types of things in the whole world whatever you wanted to talk about could be put into 16 categories and they decided there was another branch called Vaisheshika, which was focusing only on object classification so they came out with saying we don't need 16 we can do with uh, seven so then the nyaya guys started with Vaisheshika and said yeah that makes sense we will take that, integrate into ours, and create a system which combines uh, logical inference with etymology. That means classification of objects in the world and is about the relation. So the two branches find it's called Navinaya or Tarka Shastra. So like that, there is a live tradition of taking different uh, points and merging them together. Okay, <clears throat> so that is the theory part. I just want to take a few examples uh, to give a sense of how, what it actually looks like. So first is definition of a sutra. It says sutra alpaksharam asandidham saravad shomukha astobham anavadhyacha sutram sutra vidho vidho. It means the knowers of a sutra know that a sutra has to be concise, unambiguous, essential. That means it should cover whatever it is supposed to cover completely or whatever sutra is addressing that particular thing is captured completely that means it applies in all the cases it is not leaving out some part hanging economical that means it doesn't have any superfluous elements and irrefutable that means there is no flaw in it it is solid this is what a sutra is so typically very compact it will a lot of things for example, in the program, there is Akasari Dira. This is a sutra from Ashtadhyayi grammar. It captures the whole phenomenon of vowel elongation. For example, A plus A becomes A. A also becomes A. U plus U becomes U, Dira, like that. So that whole, all those permutation combinations are captured by this one sutra. Similarly, in Vedanta, there is something called Tattvam Asi. This one sentence of three words captures the whole essence of Advaita Vedanta. So you can write whole books about what it means, why it means, and so on. But the essence is captured by this. Second example, uh, which we have talked about is Man Pramana. How is it actually applied and uh, for convincing somebody else? So for example, that example I gave, the mountain has fire, that is called the proposition. Then due to smoke is called the reason. But Pervasion. Wherever there is smoke, there is fire. Example, like in the kitchen. Then you say, this is just like that. Therefore, this is true. Like a QED in our maths. So then if you see the Sanskrit part, there is specific terminology and uh, the way it is presented. And there are names for all these parts. Called Pratidnya, Hetu, Vyapti, and so on. So there are specific uh, <clears throat> guidelines for how to do this. Okay. Um, the second example, slightly longer one. If you think about it for a moment and say, can I define happiness? Uh, how does it come about? So Kautilya's Arthashastra has given it a lot of thought, particularly in the context of a king or in general of a government. And how, what is the correlation between, see, a government is supposed to keep the subjects happy, right? So how does that happen? So Look at this. It says the source of happiness. Normally, you think source of happiness is what wealth 
uh, objects, uh, etc. But he says no. The source of happiness is dharma, integrity. So then it follows the chain. What is the source of integrity? Is wealth. Because only when you have wealth can you afford to say integrity. If you have money in your bank, you can afford to be honest. If you are starving, then you are going to go and you know try and uh, steal something because you have to survive. So that's a fact of it. So he says the source of happiness is integrity. The source of integrity is wealth. Source of wealth is governance. If you have good governance in a place, then people can engage in their economic activities and create wealth. Otherwise, there's chaos and disorder, nothing gets created. Source of governance is self-control, sense control. This is a subtle point. We see that a lot of governments collapse because the governors become, I mean, the people who are in government become greedy and corrupt and they can't control themselves. So this, it says the source of governance is sense control. Where does that come from? It comes from humility, that you don't consider yourself to be the ultimate. You know that there are people who are better than you, superior than you, and you respect them. Who are those? Those are those who are wise. Only if you respect the wise people in your land, then you can learn the truth from them. By knowing the truth, you can enrich yourself. By enriching yourself, you experience self-worth. If you are self-worthy, then you can attract all kinds of wealth. And if you are wealthy, then you also make your subjects wealthy. So if you are a king, then you make your subjects wealthy. If you are a householder, then you make your family wealthy, and so on. And when there, are, there is wealth in the land or in the family, then that family or land can govern itself, even if there is no king. So this is the depth, and this is the way to which um, deep insights they have thought about and come out. You will see this in every area of life. So to summarize um, what I want to say about Indian knowledge systems, in order to evaluate something, forget about whether it's applicable or not. First, you have to evaluate saying that is it useful or not. So even to evaluate, we need to understand it first. And to understand, we need to know what is the uh, elements of it, what are the paradigms, parameters. And it has to be evaluated using those. For example, uh, if you want to compare, the, I took this example because we are in COVID uh, pandemic and everybody is thinking about how to come out of it. So it's worth exploring what Ayurveda has to say about it. Now, if you want to uh, look at Ayurveda, you, um, it must be first understood before you can compare it with Alabama. Um So that's where we say that knowledge system, culture and language are inseparable. In Indian knowledge systems, it says, know thyself to know the world. Yatha pindande, tatha brahmande. So whatever is inside you is reflected in the outer world. So you don't need to uh, look at outside things. So the Ayurveda view, for example, would be to say, strengthen your immune system instead of identifying different viruses and trying to find different cures and vaccines for them. Ayurveda, way, they will not say whether it's Corona or Girona or HNV. It will say, what is your pravruti? Are you more impact, uh, in, in, impacted by this, this or this? Accordingly, we'll give you a thing to correct that balance. Once your body is strong, it can define any type of virus. That is the word, that is the viewpoint. So, therefore, you can't compare Ayurveda and say, have you solved coronaviruses before? Because the whole approach was different. So, in Ayurveda, you don't work with the physical body. You don't try to dissect the body. And because you say body is jada shariram. It is, you know, uh, lifeless. What will I do with it? My um, upachara is on a conscious being, that is Chetan Purush. There is a whole definition of what that means, but it is very different from a physical body. It includes energy elements and things uh, like uh, doshas and uh, koshas and things like that, which are technical, I will not get into that. Then the structure must be understood before the content. For example, uh, that's the reason why all those middle elements in that big diagram have to be studied before you can study the shastras in depth. Even though you might be interested only, for example, in um, yoga, you still have to understand Nyaya and Vyakrana because those will be applied to study the uh, yoga sutras. So uh, the structure must be understood before the content. What are the assumptions? What are, how is the things expressed? All this. And all this can be properly understood only in the language it is encoded. For example, prana is not breath or life force or energy. The moment you try to translate it to English, something will be lost. You can't get an exact translation for many of the words because they are very specific. 
Therefore, Indian knowledge systems must be studied in Sanskrit. Studying via translation only causes confusion. That is the reason why I have put my slides. I took the effort to put all these in Sanskrit because I know all of you are interested in Sanskrit. At some point, I suggest that you go back and read the whole thing in Sanskrit as well. And then you will see its power and beauty. OK, so uh, we will do the invocation and uh, then we can take questions and. Uh, uh, those who need to leave have other engagements can uh, go ahead. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bunatu Sahapiriam Karvavahai Tejasvinavadhi Tamastuma Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Yeah, so I request uh, so two things, uh, please give your feedback about uh, whether this session was good, bad, ugly, whether you want to see more sessions like this. Um, definitely, I think we need at least two more sessions to go do justice to this. One is to cover all the Vidya Sthanas, what they mean. Second is to talk about that uh, core knowledge elements and the Shastra part. What are those definitions, how they work together? And actually, each of those boxes I showed in the Vidyasthanas can be a course in itself. But it's up to you guys what you're interested in, what makes most sense. But I would say at least you should have a parallel thread where in one thread you're studying different Shastras of interest. In the other, you're studying all this background material um, which is required, like Naya, Vyakana, uh, and so on, which are required to make sense of so in parallel if you do this, it'll make, uh, it will be more effective. That would be my suggestion. And uh, I'm always uh, available. Bharat, uh, I think, is planning to take the subsequent session where we talk about Vidyasthanas. If you want, then I can come back after that and do a session, do deep dive into the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, 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 Shastra and all those concepts and terminology. One of us can come back and do that. So let us know whether you would like that. And in general, if you have questions and uh, comments, you can uh, send me email. Um, my email ID is amitrao.human at gmail.com. Okay, so with that, uh, I will, I think we have about 10 minutes to take uh, in question and answers. I would request um, Prabhat to, uh, you know, curate it and ask on the behalf of whoever asked those questions. If there are any pending questions. Uh, namaste, Amini. So, so thank you so much. So, if something if something is not addressed, please feel free to send me mail. I will try and respond uh, as far as possible. If I don't know, I will say I don't know. I'll try to find out. It's not that I have all the answers, but I can try to answer to the extent possible. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Amitji, for such a wonderful session. Uh, there are a few questions which the students have come across and they've asked us. And uh, yeah, this is something which, which is very interesting that you know many people might be interested to know as well. So one of the questions mm -hmm. that the uh, students have asked is, you know, what can be a starting point for us to get started with these shastras? You know, uh, because the repository is so huge, uh, what yeah. would be the starting point for anyone? Uh, could you please yeah. help us uh, yeah. with your ideas yeah. on this? Yeah. So as I said, I think a logical static point is logic itself. So I think Nyaya Tarkashastra, which talks about uh, how to look at the world and use uh, Pratyaksha Pramana Anumana to uh, identify objects and the relations between them and how to categorize them, etc. is what Nyaya uh, Vaisheshika deals with. Um, so that Navya Nyaya, which I talked about, which is uh, it's also called Tarkashastra would be a good starting point because even uh, it will be required and helpful for all the other Shastras. And anyway, I'm assuming that because you're interested in Sanskrit, you'll be studying uh, Sanskrit uh, language per se and uh, uh, Vyakrana in detail at some point. So I would say Nyaya and Vyakrana are the two foundational uh, platform which must be studied to some depth before you can do justice to reading the Shastras on your own. To do that, then you'll be well placed to do that. And we can take a few sessions where we can do go into depth on each of them. Thank you. Uh, 
I understand correctly what you would say is language and understanding the structure of these shastras would be the key to you know uh, unearthing the knowledge that is there in this system. Correct. correct, correct. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so one of the other interesting questions that I came across by one of the students was, uh, you know, you were, you were talking about how the index system has the observer at the uh, the center of, uh, you know, uh, the knowledge, right? And it's part of the knowledge uh, system as well. So how can knowledge be only one if it is dependent on the observer? Uh, it could be subjective is one of the questions that was asked by one of our students. Yeah. That is why I said that uh, the Indian, Indian knowledge systems uh, is inclusive. It, uh, it accommodates both types of knowledge. It recognizes that certain types of knowledge is objective, certain type of knowledge is subjective. So instead of throwing out the subjective and saying it is out of scope, it is saying you treat objective knowledge as objective, treat subjective knowledge as subjective and deal with both. That's why you have Prateksha Praman, which is objective. If I see this mobile, there's not going to be any question about this. Anybody else sees it will also say this is a mobile. This is Prateksha Pramana. But when it comes to things like, uh, you know, uh, whether this uh, policy is correct for India or that policy is correct, there can be difference of opinion, there can be debate. So therefore, we can logically put forth all the arguments and debate it and come to a satisfactory conclusion. Or we can conclude that it is not possible to conclude whatever it is so there is a whole uh, tradition and uh, guidelines for different types of uh, knowledge and how to deal with them uh, adding to this i think one of the other things that uh, you know maybe you can correct me if i'm wrong what what you're trying to say is the indic knowledge system makes room for both your pure sciences and uh, what we call as a social sciences as well like you know psychology Absolutely. and other aspects and they have Absolutely. created and it uh, does so it does so without creating rigid boundaries that this is hard, this is soft, this is hard, this is science, this is social science, this is non-social science. It doesn't do that. What it does instead is that three uh whole thing, vidya, darshanam, and shastra. It is darshanam mm -hmm. if it is doing a worldview and talking about what is uh, who are you as a self, what is the world, and how are you related with that? How the world was created and how and how uh, what is your relation with all of that? If it is talking about that, then it's called darshan. But if it's talking about anything else, then it is called a shastra, where it has to go through that whole process which I described, where you have to identify the objects, relations, their uh, mutual relation, you have to define, you have to first say what is the scope, anubandha chatushtam, and you have to decide, uh, you have to state what are the uh, you know uh, categories you'll be dealing with. For each of those, you have to define things. Then you have to examine them and see whether your definitions are rock solid then you can apply them to real life things. Based on that, you can refine the rules and so on. So there's a whole cycle. Uh, Bode, one more question was, um, yeah. uh, in terms of how the Indic knowledge system is scientific in its pursuit of knowledge, in the mm -hmm. sense that um, are there, uh, these Shastras, have they evolved over a period of time or once the Shastra was actually, you know, um, yeah. Once the Shastic knowledge was shared or it was you know published or it was done orally, uh, it was full and final. So do we have any system like this where, you know, let's say there were discussions and uh, how did yeah. this evolve over time? Can you just throw a glimpse at this? Yeah, I already said a little about that. I will uh, reiterate. In this whole Vidya Sanan thing, the only thing that is considered as a sacrosanct is the Vedas because that is the focus is on the sound rather than the meaning. So because it's sound, that sound has to be preserved in the exact way. But everything else above, beyond that is open to a verification, debate, discussion, and evolution. And it has evolved. Like I gave the example that earlier there was Navya Naya, uh, um, old Nyaya, which is, uh, talked about 16 top level categories, which could be talked about. Then there was Vaisheshika, which talked about seven top level categories. And this, uh, was able to include that all everything was able to be accommodated in this seven system so we didn't need 60. so there's a, there's there are also principles of how to merge and what should be the criterion so there is a criterion called economy lagatva if something the same thing can be accomplished by shorter uh, means like less uh, processing or less cognition load then that is definitely better so it, therefore instead of 16 we take seven top level categories therefore um, Vaisheshika was merged with Old Nyaya and we created this uh, system called Navya Nyaya, which was as probably late as the 
8th century AD or something. So in Indian knowledge systems, 8th century is pretty late. Okay. Something like that. I don't remember the exact date, but it was not very, uh, it was not thousands of years ago. It is like few centuries ago. So that uh, that keeps happening. There are examples. And there, as I said, uh, in Mimamsa, there were two schools of thought. There was uh, Prabhakar school and uh, Kumaril Bhatt. <clears throat> Prabhakar was actually Kumaril Bhatta's student. But at some point, Kumaril Bhatt got stuck with the problem and Prabhakar was able to solve it. So Kumaril said, you are a guru in your own right. So he went and created a school of thought called, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the Pra Prabhakar Mat, Prabhakar Mat, and he is called the Guru Mat. Whereas uh, Bhatt the school is called the Bhatta Mat, and they both uh, have their own proponents. They, those who think that they make sense, they follow that, and then they also have debates. They agree on some things, they disagree on some things. So it's a very uh, meritocracy-based uh, system, I would say. Anybody can have an opinion as long as that opinion can be defended with pramana, valid valid evidence, uh, and you can reason it out and establish why it is so, then uh, you will be recognized. So there are a lot of examples left. So I gave this two of them. Uh, thank you so much, sir. So I think most of the uh, questions are covered within this and I think we are running short of time as well. Yes. Um, rest of the thing, I think there has been some interest from students asking about how they can learn the Shastras or, you know, how they can learn Sanskrit. Uh, so, yeah, you know, this yeah. is these are all things that, you know, they can take up, uh, uh, you know, in their, in their spare time. So, yeah, I think that's, that's it from the questions uh, standpoint. Thank you, sir. Okay. okay. Namaskar. Uh, hello all. Uh, a couple of points regarding Sastra Setu. Uh, there will be a series of talk and the information will be conveyed to you all. Uh, you can uh, keep a tab on the club website which I have shared link in the chat. Also you can visit the club Facebook page and other social media handles. You can all find links on the website and in chat also. Uh, second point, the recording of this uh, session and all the slides these two will be shared to you in an email after this event uh, maybe tonight or tomorrow along with a feedback form uh, at which you can fill your feedback, opinions, doubts, suggestions or anything uh, you consider. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you Amit sir. So I have put up my email ID. Somebody had asked. Somebody had asked. The audio started. I couldn't hear. So it's there on the screen. I'll uh, speak it out again. It's amitrao dot human at gmail dot com. Uh, I have put it in the chat. It's right. Okay. So okay. thanks once again, everybody. Thanks to the organizers and thanks to uh, uh, Mr. Butt for uh, monitoring the chat and curating those questions. Thank you.